In this episode, we're going to be discussing suicide and self-harm. If you've been affected by these issues, support is available from the Samaritans, Papyrus, Shout, and many other organisations, details of which are on the Swansea University webpage that is hosting this podcast. Hello and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges, from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blaxland and today I'm joined by Anne John, Professor of Public Health and Psychiatry here at Swansea. Anne's research explores suicide and self-harm prevention. She's an honorary consultant in public health medicine and also Public Health Wales' national lead for suicide and self-harm prevention. And she chairs the National Advisory Group to Welsh Government for suicide and self-harm prevention. Professor Anne John, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Thanks very much for having me. Can we start off uh, just with you giving us an overview of your research and telling us about some of your key findings? So my research focuses on suicide and self-harm prevention we also have a have a particular interest in young people. Um, and I think the reason for that is because when people are vulnerable or in distress, they will often, you know, we we did one piece of research where we looked at absences and exclusions at school. And we found that if a child had been excluded from school, they were almost seven times more likely to have self-harmed. And so what you see is that that those risks and some of the things that happen to young people, they impact their trajectory. So they almost collect difficulties. And so I really think that intervention, both in the early years, but also in adolescence, are, are where we particularly focus the work that we do. So it's about identifying problems, but also about, like you say, this interventionary stage as well. I was listening to an item on the radio yesterday, actually, which which brought home the fact that um, suicide's the biggest killer of people under 35. So obviously, in terms of it being a problem, there, there is a, well, that that is one of the significant issues at hand here. So I guess there's something to unpick a bit there. Mm. So the the highest rates of suicide are actually in middle-aged men. Right. Um, but... For young people, they don't really die of other things. Mm. So suicide is is the commonest, really, in, in, you know, sort of older adolescence, cause of death. I guess the other thing, you know, and every time, I think particularly when a young person dies, but whenever there's a loss through suicide, it's deeply tragic. It deeply affects families, professionals. There was a piece of work done by a colleague that showed that for every one death by suicide, almost 135 people were affected around them. So there's a real ripple effect. And I guess the other important thing to note, particularly for young people, is that over the last decade, even though the rates are much lower than for middle-aged people, they have been increasing. Right. I'm sure we'll come on to that in a second. Obviously, this is a this is a difficult topic to talk about just in terms of the content, but also the terms and the vocabulary um, aren't straightforward either. I mean, there's this phrase to commit suicide, which I know a lot of people still use. It's a very old kind of historic term, but it's not something that that we or that you would encourage using. But do you want to just say a little bit more about you know how, how you actually just in terms of the language, how you talk about this topic? So I think it so I think there's two really important reasons to be sort of careful careful and thoughtful about the language that you're using. Now, the first is stigma. So the reason why the word commit is a no-no is because it harks back to when suicide was a criminal act. And suicide being a criminal act was something that meant that it was very stigmatised and shameful for families and people who were having suicidal thoughts. Now, it's really important to note that it was only about five years ago that the criminal burden of proof for a coroner to conclude that a death was suicide simply happened five years ago. So in coroner's courts, it's always balance of probabilities other than for suicide deaths. So that's important. Um, The other reason is... Is really sort of about 
the people involved and how they feel. And so, you know, things like um, deliberate self-harm, there's something about the word deliberate that is a bit like you're a naughty child. Or when we talk about imitation of, of behaviours, which is one of the mechanisms that, that we talk about in, in suicide prevention. You know, sometimes people use the word copycat. You know, there's, a, there's a, an infantilising of people through the language we use. And then other words like completed and successful should be avoided. But I guess the other side of that in, you know, current cancel culture society is that some words are so colloquial, like commit suicide. Mm. You know, people, people are using them without thought. And I know that when I first started working in the field and became aware of its connotations, it took me a while. You know, I would every now and then I would be like, mustn't use that word. So, so I think we both need to be conscious about the language because we don't want to cause distress. We don't want to add to stigma. But also be generous towards people who are distressed. Yeah. And people who might be using the terms thinking they're, they're doing so normally and yeah you know, absolutely and just and, and trying to contribute something to the debate yeah not jumping down their throats or whatever yeah. yeah something i talked a moment about about news items and media items something that we hear a lot about i think or i seem to hear about in the in the news is the the link or the perceived link between self-harm suicide even and social media use what are your reflections on that so we've done a lot of research in relation um to social media and i th- i think I think we talk about it in a way that there are the there's bad. So most people over over forty that I talk to, it'll be social media is bad. It's the cause of all ills in younger people. Um, in actual fact, there are positives and negatives about the online environment. Mm. You know, so particularly in in the area of, of suicide and self harm. You know, images and conversations can be triggering. They can reinforce behaviours. You can be exposed to things you wouldn't be normally. But equally, we know that self-harm is is commoner in young people who are lonely and isolated. And people who, you know, like say from LGBTQ communities, there's a, a few studies out there that show people find community. So there are pluses and minuses. Sometimes people are sharing imagery of self-harm to denote their road to recovery. So, so the way I think about it is, one, it's not going away. Mm. Two, it's really hard for research to keep up with the pace with which it changes. You know, my oldest child was on Bebo. My youngest child doesn't even know what that is. Mm. And I guess three... The online environment um, is dynamic. People's feelings, emotions and suicidal thoughts are dynamic. And so one thing may be bad one day for the same person and it may be a positive experience for them the next day. And it will be different between different individuals. So, So I think it's a really complicated area and what we pro- what we do need to do is one be equipping young people in how to manoeuvre that world. Two, I I think there's probably a lot more that platforms can do. In one of the pieces of work we did, people wanted more agency over what they saw. Mm. You know, there's um, if you look for something, you then see a lot more of it. Indeed. And it's very difficult to control that. And it came across really strongly that uh, young people in particular want a lot more agency online. Mm. Not just the algorithm giving them lots of stuff. I mean, when I think about general mental health and and social media use, I I tend to think that almost all the social media platforms present sometimes a life or other people's lives to you as being very cool or interesting or clever or, you know, the, the images you see of people with sort of perfect physiques and that and that can actually be a, a problematic or, or 
or troubling for for young people. But but it's often darker than that, isn't there? Because like you say, there are often kind of almost kind of self um, guided kind of uh, things online about how to self harm or whatever. So it's, it's it is clearly a minefield in some ways. I I think where we always have to come back to mm. is. You know, sometimes it's quite vulnerable people sharing content. And so it really is about making sure that when people are self-harming, the people looking after them are asking about their online activity. So there's a lot of young people who have taken their own lives, have been looking for suicide and self-harm content online. So I think that's it's important that both parents and practitioners are having those conversations. And then I think, you know, from a very young age, we need to be teaching young people how to manoeuvre the online environment. You talked about people having more agency over what they see. Do you think the social media companies could or should be doing more in this regard? Absolutely. Um, no two ways about it. I think if you can... Make an algorithm that pushes content, you can make an algorithm that doesn't. How? <laughs> Putting pressure on them, talking directly to them? I mean, how do you actually get through to the people who matter in these regards? Because they're often quite big, powerful figures, aren't they? I think, actually, um, there have there are relationships with um, industry part, social media industry partners. So um, the work that we did, well, one of the pieces of work, we've done a lot of work in this arena, was with the Samaritans. And, the, and they have an ongoing relationship with some of the biggest social media platforms. Because I've also done lots of work with the media because we know that the way suicide is portrayed in the media can have an impact on people. So, you know, the way suicide and self-harm is depicted in soaps and on TV storylines, the way it's reported in newspapers. So Samaritans have responsible media guidelines. Usually, when you're talking face-to-face -face with people, most people don't want to do harm. However, in other industries, they're also driven by different things. And I think it's making sure that we find ways to work together. You do quite a lot of work with school children and young people, don't you, in your, in yeah. your work? Do you want to tell us more about that? So the social media work is a big piece of work. And we have um, what we call Share UK, which is a self-harm research register. And people have signed up and whenever we're doing a, a project related to self-harm, we contact that group and people who want to be involved. And when, when I say involved, that's from us thinking about how we're going to do the project to being participants. So we'll often hold meetings and groups with people to say, well, what do you think about this? What, what do you think, when we, should we ask about this? When we did the questionnaires um, for the Samaritan Social Media Project, we went over all the questions with the people from there. And then we do a fair bit of work in schools. So basically, particularly working with schools data. So one of the things when we did the absence and exclusion data is we, we sort of said, well, unsurprisingly, absences and exclusions are much higher in young people who self-harm and have mental health problems. Mm. Schools collect that data routinely. Why don't we use that to highlight young people who need early support? So, so I think, from my point of view, there's a lot of things that happen in school that mean they're sort of great settings for interventions. But you must never forget the kids that aren't in school. Yeah, and I, I saw from your your profile page and everything that, that this is one of the challenges that the sort of exclusions or the um or the absences is is, is a is a big challenge here. But you, you talked about um also in, the, in these in these profiles as well, you talk about big data and 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 using data. I mean, that in itself is a challenge, isn't it? Sort of using 
using these this this kind of material. So I guess so I um you know I was a junior doctor and, and a GP so I work a lot with health records. Mm. So you know because I helped generate them back in the day I I get how flawed they are. But the beauty of the data sets we work with is they cover the whole population. They're not perfect. There are lots of underserved groups that you don't see very accurately in there. But what I really think is is that working with that sort of data gives people a voice that they wouldn't have otherwise. Because, you know, if you're asking... You know, sometimes with, you know, if, if a young person has anxiety and we're going to be going into a school to do a survey, that's probably a day that they don't particularly want to be there. And so using, you know, big data is all about that stuff where you go about your day-to-day -day life generating data and we make sense of it, but anonymously mm. and in, in a way that's privacy protecting. So, you know, I could never identify an individual, but I can give a voice to people who, who often wouldn't participate in research. I was going to ask, is there a line of thought here that says that using other people's data, using big data is, is not a good thing? I suppose you've answered that to some extent because by saying it's anonymous, that makes a difference, doesn't it? But is, but is, is there a controversial elements to it. Oh, absolutely. So we did another study where we actually um, went out and asked young people in a survey that had, you know, I think it, I think it was a good few thousand responses um, about how they felt. And we asked young people who self-harmed, but also young people who had no, said they had no history of, of self-harm. And and basically, in general, young people, you know, so long as the research is being used for public benefit and by people they trust, so people generally from the NHS and academia, they were happy for their data to be used. I think one of the one one of the things we did uncover was that. Uh, so social media data is sort of out there, isn't it? It's publicly available. And with some of the studies, not ours, that we looked at, because it was publicly available, researchers had assumed that young people were happy for it to be used. But what we found in our study is they weren't. They wanted to give their consent. I was going to ask about challenges as well, actually, of just working with young people in general. Obviously, you've, you've identified some, but is there a challenge just getting people young people in general just to engage with all of this? Yes and no. <laughs> I think you have to really think about it. So we did a, a study that was all about um, the use of data and the use of social media data. And we really wanted to get a broad range of views. Um, and so we worked with... Um, sort of community organisations that worked with young people. So we worked a lot with um, young refugees and asylum seekers. It was an art-based virtual reality type project with an interview. So I think you have to think about how you engage with young people. And then also, I would say, design your posters and things with young people. Because... Even if you think you're working with young researchers, they struggle to get it right. What are some of the sort of tangible outcomes of all of this kind of stuff? What, if, if you were to pinpoint what you're most proud of or what you think a lot of this research is contributing to, um, what would it be? So what am I most proud of? So I think, so our research really fed in to the suicide and self-harm prevention strategy for Wales, which is due to be updated this year. I'm proud of that. I think during COVID, there were, there were a lot of concerns about what would happen in relation to suicide rates and, and in terms of how people were going to feel, 
they were going to be isolated and trapped. That's related to suicide prevent to to suicide. You know, people were at home and not everyone's home is a nice place. So people were likely to be more exposed to domestic violence. Services were disrupted. So we were really concerned. Mm. And then there were all these figures being bandied around the internet that suicides had increased by, you know, 200%. Whereas in actual fact, we didn't know. And so a whole bunch of us got together from around the world and set up a collaboration. And I co-led two studies. One was a living systematic review and one was what we call the global suicide study where we collected data from around the world. And we showed that suicide rates did not increase um, globally. There were one or two exceptions um, during the first part of the pandemic. The lockdown, the lockdowns, particularly. Yeah, so, yeah, so 2020 mm. to a lot of 2021. And the latest figures from the ONS show that we've now um, reached sort of pre-pandemic levels again. And so I'm really proud that we were, because that was being used by anti-lockdown lobbyists a lot. Um, it, it's, you know, even really recently... Um, there was a lot of talk on on social media about child suicide rates, and so it was. It's really important to be able to use science and data to show what was happening. So one of the things that we kept hearing was that self harm had increased, and this is on the ground. This is people I worked with, but when we actually looked at the data. What we saw was a massive dip in contacts. Now, that happened for everything. Mm. But the dip in self-harm was less than for everything else. So the proportion of people who self-harmed increased, which is why people felt there was an increase. But the actual numbers had dropped. Does that make sense? No, it makes absolute sense. And I'm just trying to think through it in my head because I, I suppose my... If I had to guess, I would say that people being asked to stay in their homes, not having any social contact would make people more miserable, would make them more prone to this kind of stuff. But is the conclusion, therefore, that actually it's lots of elements of our modern day life that when people were removed from it, they sort of felt like they were being removed from from whatever it was that was that was so negative about about their life? So this is one of the big questions, because if we can learn what that active ingredient was... Mm. We can use it now. And we think it was a mix of things. So there's a there's a honeymoon period when there's a disaster mm. and people pull together. So, you know, there was a lot of social cohesion, wasn't there? Lots of local activity that we think might have been protective. We also think there were loads of um, financial safety nets. And we know that financial adversity and unemployment are strongly related to suicidal behaviours. Mm. And, you know, having been quite concerned at the beginning of the pandemic and then seeing that suicide rates hadn't increased, um, you know, you don't, you don't want... You know, I don't think you can make clear predictions, but I would say there's a lot of evidence from the 2007-2008 recession about the link between unemployment and financial adversity and suicide. And I think, you know, we do really need to be thinking about active labour market policies and stuff going forward in the cost of living crisis. Lots of interlinked things. Yeah, yeah. You must be worried about the long term then, because like you say, in the short term with COVID, there was there were financial safety nets, etc. But some of the impacts of, of things like lockdown... Which I think more people are talking about now than they were at the time. I think there's kind of a more balanced, perhaps, discussion about things like you know the the, the long term economic impact, but the long term educational impacts or the long term kind of um, mental health impacts of being isolated for such, such a long time. Whilst we didn't see anything in the short term, in the medium and long term, it could play. Are you worried that sort of things might play catch up? 
It's interesting because, so there was a, a lot of um, reporting last week about a study that showed that actually the impacts on mental health weren't huge mm. um, that was published in the BMJ. I guess my comments on this would be COVID was all about disproportionate effects. You know, it was it was so it was the obvious message through almost everything. Mm. And I guess within those overarching effects, so we did a piece of work led by Matthias Pierce in Manchester, where what we showed was that that first lockdown, there was a population drop in mental health, short, sharp. The vast majority of the population recovered. But there were a couple of groups, one whose mental health just continued to deteriorate and one who just didn't improve. And in those groups, you know, and, and I bet if I got you to guess oh, yeah. who were there that you'd be able to. Well, it's not going to be people like me. It's not going to be comfortable middle class academics. People from deprived communities, yeah. people with pre-existing mental and physical health problems, ethnic minorities and young people. The people who are already adversely affected yeah. by lots of other things. And so I'm concerned about those groups. I think some of those groups are also the ones who are going to be most likely worse affected by um, financial adversity. And then I think some of the effects we've seen are small, but they're across the population. So attendance at school mm -hmm. has not quite reached pre-pandemic levels. Now, the percentages we're talking about here are not big. But that's across all the children in the UK. So the impact of that, so we know that attendance has an impact on future, you know, life chances. Mm. So, so I worry about that. And then I, th I think about, so we hear quite a lot about, you know, the the cancer appointments that didn't happen, the cardio, you know, the the heart appointments that didn't happen. But there's also a, a raft of people who, you know, self-harm is generally quite a hidden behaviour. So lots of people will never come into contact with services. But when they do, it's a real opportunity to do something. Now, there's a whole bunch of people during the pandemic who probably would have sought help and didn't because they were trying to protect the NHS, because they were scared of, of getting infected. And they wouldn't have received either the sort of assessment, we call it a psychosocial assessment, or the interventions that they needed. And I worry about them. I started off by saying that you're a member of, or you even you chair uh, various other bodies. So um, your Public Health Wales is National Lead for Suicide Self uh, Harm Prevention. Uh, you're also the chair of the National Advisory Group uh, to Welsh Government for Suicide and Self Harm Prevention. Um, how did you get into these positions, and what to, what what kind of work do you do here? My career was completely unplanned, <laughs> and I sometimes, but always, with a theme about. And I'd even forgotten, but I did like, when I did my master's, it was on self-harming prisoners. And um, so that theme had always been there. And even when I was a GP working with people um, face to face, I was the GP that everyone went and saw about their mental health, you know, when they wanted to talk about their mental health. And I guess I I basically started thinking, actually, the things that make a real difference happen at a population level. And that's how I got into public health. And public health taught me all those skills about epidemiology. Now, pre-pandemic, no one knew what epidemiology <laughs> was, but now everyone does. Mm. Um, so it's, you, see, you, can, you can use the word. And then I just, I sort of came to the university and then I think it was it was really through the research, but also because I've got, I've, I sort of sit between research in the university and the NHS, which means I have a lot of sort of knowledge, but also experience. And then through that was basically 
invited or applied to chair various groups. But I think for me, it's because I want to do research that makes a difference, which is that clinical part of me. And what do those particular roles involve that I mentioned? Are they very time consuming or or not? I assume they probably are. <laughs> I guess what's amazing about them. So, so suicide, you know, rarely is a result of one, you know, it's rarely one reason. You know, there's lots of, you know, things to do with you know, people's past to do with their personalities, you know, perfectionist or impulsive, and to do with their life circumstances. So things that might have happened to them in the past or things happening currently. It could be to do with financial adversity, housing, drugs, alcohol, mental health problems. So there's not a, one organisation that can prevent suicide. So what these groups do is it they bring everyone together you know and they and they make people realize that only through working together can we prevent suicide and self-harm what do they mean on a day-to-day basis it means you know drawing up agendas making sure the right people are speaking um managing conversations you know people I think chairing is about making sure that everyone gets heard. But, you know, often people are speaking from different perspectives, different understandings of, of the same thing. So it's, it's bringing everyone together and managing those, helping, I guess managing is the wrong word, isn't it? Enabling those conversations. And those conversations then lead to things like reports being written up or advice being delivered to certain groups or even government? All of the above. And we work, you know, so we're about to renew the strategy this year, Wales, I mean. So, you know, last time we worked with, we had um, Elfin Williams, who worked in Welsh government on highways and byways. And we worked with Elfin both in the design of certain bridges But also, um, suicide prevention is now in the planning documents of bridges. So it has to be considered in the design of bridges. So we did lots of work in relation to improving prevention. And prevention is a... Prevention is a key part, actually, of your work, isn't it? We were talking earlier about mitigation and about and about the, the early stages of the research, but prevention is actually a key part, a key plank of this too. Absolutely. And I guess one of the biggest myths about suicide is that it's inevitable. You know, every, you know, suicide is eminently preventable. Now, a moment ago, you mentioned about the way in which certain things like soap operas or TV dramas can present the issue of suicide. But you didn't say that you've actually worked directly with some of these, haven't you? Uh, absolutely. So I work a lot with the Samaritans. So we did, we did research early on on media reporting and developed a, a sort of scale for how to assess the quality of media reporting. And through that work, I started working closely with Lorna Fraser at Samaritans. And we, I've advised on a number of storylines from EastEnders, Hollyoaks, This Is Going To Hurt. And what it is, is that there are certain things that if you uh, depict them, if people identify with people, then it becomes a cognitively available solution. But also if you highlight particular methods. So we really work with people to make sure to minimise those risks, you know, and work on scripts and things. For me, that's, um, I, you know, if you talk to me when I was like 14, I wanted to be a novelist. I would, for me, this is like, it's a, it's an, both an interesting side of my work. It's really important for suicide prevention. It's called the Werther Effect after the Young Werther book. But it's also, 
it's also cool to step into different worlds. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and so many people watch these programmes, don't they? Like millions and millions of people watch Coronation Street or EastEnders or whatever. And that's what I often say to the people that we're working with. You know, they can achieve more through responsible storytelling, you know, stories about help seeking and recovery than, you know, I'm afraid an academic can hope to in their lifetime, really. <laughs> However many journal articles yeah. they publish. <laughs> to be fair. Just give me a sense of how this works then. So they, uh, a soap opera might approach you or the team or the people you work with, the Samaritans or whatever, and say, we're going we're gonna to write this storyline. What do you do? Do you, do you proofread the scripts? Do you advise and then and then look at things afterwards? How, how, how does it work? So we tend um, to read the scripts and then have meetings mm. with producers, sometimes writers, sometimes the actors, you know, because I think sometimes what, what people forget is depicting these storylines is actually quite harrowing. And people really want to do it well. So sometimes they want to meet and talk through storylines and understand. And and so so I, I really, because of the numbers of people that it reaches, we don't know everything. I guess that's one of the things to say about this work is, is we know that uh, depicting methods is really potentially harmful. Mm. There are other things where we're making judgments where the, the evidence is not so certain. And I think so that these are always conversations. We don't have editorial control. It's really advice. But I think, you know, when, when everyone's working to that purpose to minimise the impact, it works really well. Has there ever been a case where you've quite liked one of these series and then you've, you know, helped with the script and then you've actually watched the relevant scenes afterwards and thought, oh, I've had an impact on this? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and even like like with with this is going to hurt because mm, it was a medical drama. Sure. And it's it's actually, you know, many of us will say this a really accurate depiction of working on a knobs and gurney ward. Yeah, you feel like you shape something that is reaching a lot of people. And and I guess I'm sl I'm driven by that in my day-to-day -day work, but it's it feels more obvious. Mm. You talked a second ago about depicting methods, and I think I was thinking this thought when you were talking about discussing stuff with young people. Is there a line of thought that says the more in some ways you talk about this, even if the motives are good, the the possibly more dangerous it can be because because you're almost advertising it. I'm, I'm sure that isn't what you would think, but I'm sure that's a critique that some people might level at your work. So that's a real myth. So mm. asking people one-to-one um, -one is, n you're not putting ideas in their head. Complete myth. Um, in fact, um, I can remember talking to a young person who had lost her mother and, you know, she that there are certain things, we wrote guidance for schools, there are certain things to notice, you know, life events in young people's lives, they start dressing differently. And she said that she felt hurt by the fact that nobody asked her. Nobody asked her about, you know, why she had pl plasters and things. So I think always ask. I think the the tricky conversation is about having these conversations with lots of young people in the same room. And it's what we call, what we're worried about are things like normalising behaviours. However, the opposite side of that, we don't have a real answer to this, this question yet. The opposite side of that is self-harm is relatively common. So in a class of 30, 14-year-olds, there will be three children self-harming you know, more than likely. And that means that children are having these conversations because they're talking to their friends about it. And it, and it, in some ways, we need to equip them to have those conversations, but in a safe way. A lot of people who do academic research, me included, who can, if they take their work home with them in their head, uh, it's no problem because they work on... <laughs> 20th century political history and, and it's all fine. If you, you deal on a day-to-day -day basis with, with a subject matter that is 
that is troubling. How do you, I guess, how do you deal with that? Or how do you maybe compartmentalise? Do you have any strategies to not always be thinking about your subject? So I guess on the one hand, I have to be really conscious about the younger researchers mm. on my team. And and also, you know, the, t the team has other people on it that aren't doing research. And we're talking about a, a lot of really difficult subjects. So, so I think there's one thing about protecting new people who come on the team. For me, myself, I, d I don't know whether it's because I've got a, I don't know, because of my background, I think a lot of, you know, we've all, we, you know, I've got people in my life that have, have died through suicide. And I think my overarching um, driver is, is that I'm making a difference. So that's what I find. There is no doubt that sometimes... You know, it's nice to get home and think about something else. You know, I, I like to, you know, walk my dog, see my friends, all, all those sorts of usual things. And one of the things we say to people is you have to find the thing that's yours. I like to read, that sort of thing. But I, But there is no doubt that the sort of work we do we do, you have to be thoughtful about what impact it's having. Well, on that note, there will be people who um, will be listening and might be thinking this is very important work, but work that they might want to go into. Perhaps they're a young person who thinks they'd like to study this in the future. What advice would you give them if they are thinking that? I guess the, the advice that I always give to people when they ask about careers is follow what you're passionate about. And if this is what you're passionate about and you want to you want to make a, a difference to do academia, you need all the, you know, qualifications after your name. You've got a it's a long, hard slog full of rejection. Um, but there are lots of ways to work in this area, you know, volunteer for the Samaritans fundamentally just be kind and understanding towards people and have those conversations. So I think there's lots of different ways you can touch upon this sort of work. But but I guess if you want to be a researcher, there's a a tried and tested path of degrees, masters, PhDs. I love being able so so you know I was a GP and then I did public health so I was a bit of a jack of all trades and I have really you know got a lot out of developing a deep knowledge about something well clearly and it's been a it's been a really fascinating conversation we appreciate it thank you Anne if you want to find out more about Anne's research you can visit her staff profile page on Swansea University's website to find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening. And thank you to my guest, Professor Anne John. If you've enjoyed this episode, please follow us. I'm Sam Blacksland, and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University. <laughs>